thank you for being here. I'll just introduce myself briefly, just so you'll kind of know and understand where I come from, so to speak. But I have, well, I am a lawyer. Um, I try not to sound like one, um, but many times I do. But I am an attorney uh, by trade that was basically thrown into the world of special education law my first day uh, practicing law. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later, but I represent school districts and have represented them for 33 years. Um, obviously, I started when I was five. <laughs> I wish that was true, um, but uh, in any event, I've been around now for more than three decades and seen a whole lot. I will say that the more things change, the more they seem to remain the same, actually, in terms of issues that continue to recycle, maybe even a repackaged fashion. Um, but um, some of the good old do's and don'ts, like these that I'm going to be talking with you about, have been around for a long time. And just being honest, I still see these things happening, um, no matter what we do in terms of our training and that kind of thing. Um, but I have an office in LA, Lower Alabama, which is where I am. I'm in Mobile. Right now, our big concern is that storm that's coming through. You may have heard uh, somewhere on the news about Dorian. Uh, feel lucky that you don't live anywhere near hurricane season, although uh, it could happen anywhere, actually. Uh, last time I was here was for CEC here in Indianapolis, and it was during the polar vortex. <laughs> so, and of course, my friends that were asking, how are you, where are you, that kind of thing, I said, it's like 35 degrees below zero. They're like, no way, it doesn't get that cold. I was like, well, I'm not going to go test it, but that's what they're saying. So, you know, we can always have our, our climate type issues, but but I live basically along the Florida panhandle where Alabama and Florida meet and I have another office in northern uh, Alabama, Birmingham area and another in Naples, Florida. We represent school districts and state departments of education uh, in Alabama, Georgia and Florida. So that's our region. But as I travel around nationally, I find the issues are pretty much the same from state to state, and I think that's because the fundamental is federal law. So uh, I don't pretend to know the specifics of obviously Indiana law uh, specifically, but I will say that a lot of the states are virtually the same, primarily because they mirror the federal requirements. So I've been, like I said, doing this for a long, long time. and. Um, Sometimes I wish for the olden days and sometimes I think they're still here. So uh, I'm not really sure uh, what we miss. But I am tasked with talking to you about um, staying out of deep doo-doo process, but otherwise known as the dirty dozen for this presentation, really focusing on 12. I could focus on a lot more than that, but knowing that I had limited time with you, I almost did the Letterman thing. If you, you know, look around and I'm like, some people may not even remember who Letterman is, but he did that top 10 thing. So I thought about doing 10 and then I thought, no, oh, let's go with a dozen and go with one of my dad's favorite movies, uh, The Dirty Dozen. So thus the name of what we're gonna talk about this afternoon. So this is all focusing on procedural issues relative to the development of the IEP. And of course, to me, they are just as important, if not in some situations more important, than content or substantive issues related to developing the IEP. And of course, the Indiana IEP Resource Center was focused on things that are IEP related, so that's what we're focusing on. And specifically, as I said, in the development, the process we use in developing the IEP. Hopefully you'll find these tips, so do's and don'ts, as I actually phrase them, to be helpful to train staff yourselves. Uh, feel free, lots of people email, call me and ask, can I use your, your dirty dozen to do training um, at the schools? Please feel free. Uh, the handout is yours. Uh, my understanding is there's a link to the breakout session handouts, so hopefully you have access to it. And I'll be talking about on page nine is a so-and-so case, so you might want to take a note if you don't have it in front of you to be able to take notes on it. So I'll be referencing that handout. I'm a real old school presenter. 
I've been presenting for a long time and there were days when we didn't have PowerPoint at all. And I've kind of gone kicking and screaming into PowerPoint, knowing that it's kind of expected that every presenter these days will have it. But I'm not going to ever probably abandon my handout. So it'll be there and it's full of additional information that supports what I'm saying. I, I don't know. I feel the need to always have the handout to show that I'm not making this stuff up. Um, I couldn't if I tried. Now I will say something about this presentation and it's probably because I've been doing this as long as I have. It is all about legal issues and what the law requires, but I will also say that some of my comments are based on my experience um, with what goes on in the process of an IEP meeting and how that could be better generally. So some of my comments are practice comments rather than what the law requires. For instance, just by way of example, I'm going to talk about good preparation for IEP meetings. Well, the law doesn't require you to prepare for an IEP meeting, but if you don't, <laughs> you're going to have probably some big significant legal issues. So that's what I mean by that. So I have some practice tips as well as just legal do's and don'ts that go along with each one of these. So the way I have set this up and I just this this was my thought pattern when I was sitting down and developing this. I thought, you know, I don't ever know what level of knowledge the audience has. So I can't ever assume that folks are understanding everything I'm talking about by way of background, um, particularly seeing a lot of newbies in the field. You know, I can always tell the retired special ed directors because they're smiling during my presentations because um, <laughs> they're retired. And everybody else these days, I mean, we're seeing a lot of new folks coming in. So I never want to talk over people's heads. And I thought, you know, I do need to kind of set this up in terms of why process in the development of the IEP is so important and how it relates overall to the legal standard for free appropriate public education. So this is sort of the in case you missed it part of what I'm going to do and I'm just going to set it up so you'll understand my thought pattern and the foundations of looking at an IEP and whether it affords a student a free appropriate public education from a procedural perspective but I want you to understand why I've set it up the way that I have. So many of you, I'm certain, uh, are familiar with the Rowley case. And I just want to talk about the fact that at least what I've been seeing in the last couple of years, even though the Supreme Court visited, or I might say revisited the FAPE standard in 2017, court cases right now are still relying on Rowley first and foremost. They have not abandoned Rowley in favor of injury. And I think it's because they're, you know, injury really didn't change Rowley that much. It just clarified what it didn't mean uh, in terms of the standard for FAPE. And, and I'll explain that in a second. But it's still referred to as the seminal or go-to case in special education law. And so the rally, and you've got all the citations in your materials if you've never read it before and you want to head to a law library and get it, which I'm sure you'll probably forego happy hour just to do that this afternoon. Um, you've got the citations there for your convenience. But bottom line in terms of what rally was all about, because you, don't, you can't really understand the standard if you don't understand the fact circumstances just generally. So Amy Rowley. Um, is an adult hearing impaired um, young lady now. Um, Amy Rowley actually, I have seen her present at conferences herself. Uh, she's very interesting. Anybody seen her ever present? She's, she's, she's deaf but she's uh, very oral and easy to understand. And so she actually presents at conferences and she's intriguing I think. I think she does a really great job talking about what it was like to be the child at issue in the case, what her parents were going through, what she remembers about being the kid that, you know, was a member of the family that sued the school district and all of that. Um, and of course, this was really, really early on after what we call IDEA today, now then known as Public Law 94142, came into existence. 
And so one of the things that the law specifically doesn't define very well is free appropriate public education. It just essentially says specially designed instruction that's free, no cost to the parents, that's you know, uh, compliant with public uh, education standards, and that's about it. So long story short, Amy's parents, while satisfied pretty much with the educational program that she was receiving, felt like she could do even better than she was doing. And she was actually performing, mo for the most part, better than her non-disabled peers, both academically and behaviorally, pretty much in a full-time regular ed setting. She had a little bit of pull-out instruction for speech services and things like that, but that was it. Her parents, though, got wind of 94-142 and thought, hey, you know, we think this law requires the school district to maximize her potential. Or in other words, she can do even better than she's doing. We acknowledge she's doing well, but she could do even better than that if the school system would pay for an interpreter to be with her full time, including in all of her academic classes. And that was their argument. And of course, the school district's response was, well, we hope to achieve maximization of potential for all of our students. But if to provide that requires a bigger and better program, the best uh, that we could provide, then we're in trouble because Congress has not funded that appropriately. While that is our ultimate goal for everybody, we haven't been given the funds to necessarily provide the best program that will ensure maximization of potential legally. So that was the debate and the U.S. Supreme Court decided in 1982 to take the case because they felt they needed to clarify, or the court felt it needed to clarify for parents and school districts across the country, what is the standard in terms of what schools must ensure is available to a child with a disability? Is it the best program? Is it one that ensures maximization of potential or is it something else? And the Rowley Court is best known for holding that maximization of potential, while admirable, is not the required legal standard, and came up with this language to clarify the FAPE standard in 1982. School districts must provide an IEP that is reasonably calculated to enable the student to receive some educational benefit. So does that clear it up for everyone? Do I need to say more? <laughs> well, uh, okay. That was helpful in terms of at least knowing that free appropriate public education doesn't, max, doesn't require maximization. So in cases where a parent was looking at a private school setting as a better program for the child, we might not even dispute that it's a better program with better resources and all of that. Rowley didn't require it. Or a particular methodology that might be preferred over another Ultimately, Rowley was like, well, but as long as the child can receive some educational benefit with the methodology the school is using, then that's sufficient. That will be FAPE. So that's how Rowley kind of evolved in terms of how it was used and how it continues to be used today. But between 1982 and 2017, the circuit courts across the country, now in Indiana, you're in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. The Seventh Circuit's FAPE standard in terms of how they, uh, how your court actually interpreted Rowley is very similar to how the Eleventh Circuit where I am, Georgia, Florida, and Alabama, that's my circuit, actually interpreted Rowley. But all of the circuits looked at it or used a little bit different language, so it was a little different depending on which jurisdiction. But when I look at them as a whole, I always felt like the courts were pretty consistent in terms of how they interpreted rally. But the lingo was different. Now, some courts would continue to use the lingo, some educational benefit. You know, if it's good enough for the Supreme Court, it's good enough for us, so we're going to stick with that. Still others used meaningful educational benefit. And meaningful educational benefit is what your Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals used 
and my 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And I always preferred meaningful educational benefit in my training of folks because it's more child focused. What's meaningful for one child may not be for another. And so that was why I always preferred using it, no matter what jurisdiction I was in, because I felt like they all kind of agreed that what's appropriate needs to be analyzed in light of the particular child's disability, you know, the individual needs of the child and that kind of thing. Still other courts went with more than trivial educational benefit, saying that the some educational benefit rally standard means that a child needs to receive more than trivial educational benefit. And still one court, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals to be specific, came up with this language, merely more than de minimis educational benefit will do. So I don't know if you're familiar with the term de minimis or what it means, but if you look it up in a dictionary, essentially it means insignificant, very little. And I'm here to tell you though that I've never heard in my professional career out of anybody's mouth that this was the standard. Even if I was in the 10th Circuit in Colorado or Wyoming, Wyoming, <laughs> Wyoming <laughs> um, ultimately no one has ever come to me and said, you know, Julie, we're going to be fine in this due process case we have because we're providing a little bit better than nothing to this kid. I would have said, well, good luck with that. I hope you have a good lawyer. Um, and if it was my client, I'd say no can do because I like to win. And that kind of lingo, I thought, was, no, no, whoever thought rally meant that. But because in the Andrew case, the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals used that standard, the U.S. Supreme Court said, you know what, we need to review that decision because it looks like courts all across the country are using different lingo. We need to settle this once and for all in terms of what rally meant. And they did so, as you well know, in the Andrew case. And again, if you've been at this for a good bit of time, you've heard more about the Andrew case than you want to. But I can't assume that everybody here knows all of the ins and outs of it that are relevant to what I have to talk about today. So I just want to just present it to you so that we have a good foundational understanding of free, appropriate public education. So Andrew is a different kid than Amy. Andrew, severely autistic student with a lot of challenging behaviors primarily, a lot of elopement and aggression, um, that kind of thing. He had the same special ed teacher from first grade to fourth grade who testified that he clearly was becoming much more of a challenge for her in terms of what she felt like she could do meeting his needs without a lot of support. But as they were creating IEPs over the years, from fourth grade to the fifth grade, when they sat down to propose an IEP for fifth grade, the parents just basically said, enough already. This is the same thing you've been doing. We're not happy with how he is not progressing, at least in our eyes, and we are going to place him in a private school for students with autism, which they did, ultimately felt like he had progressed significantly in the private setting, turned to the school system to ask for funding, and the school district defended what it had offered. Well, the long story short, court looked at it and said, I see some progress over the years. I feel like that is a free appropriate public education, and the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed it, saying merely more than de minimis is the standard, and they met that. Well, having none of that, the family, with their lawyer, asked the Supreme Court to review that decision, saying, is that the standard? Is that what Rowley meant way back in 1982, that merely more than de minimis would cut it? And as you well know, unless you've been somewhere um, away for quite some time, the Andrew Court agreed with the family to the degree that merely more than de minimis was not appropriate, but the family was actually back to arguing maximization of potential, so the court rejected that and said, this is what we think. We're going to reframe Rowley a little bit and clarify that to meet its substantive obligation under IDEA, a school must 
make available an IEP that's reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So does that clear it up? <laughs> well, the problem with any kind of legal standard is always going to depend on the individual situation. And that's why I think the court used in light of the child's circumstances. When I am training our, what I call, content people, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, but at IEP meetings, I see folks in the role of either process people or content people. And I'll explain that by what I mean. But content people, to me, are your special ed teachers and other service providers. And when I'm training them, it's a whole different training because we're talking about the substantive or content of that IEP, the substance or content, the real focus, I think, needs to be on that word progress. All, all the training that I do with respect to content and legally defensible content is what do we believe is reasonably calculated to assist this child to make progress and let's be able to demonstrate that it's doing that. Um, but I've always said that. So when this standard came out, I did not feel like it had drastically changed anything. I feel like it is a clarification. And for two years, we've been living with that decision, and I still believe that. I still feel that way, that if schools were doing what they were supposed to do all along, then we were fine with this language. There is nothing that should bother us. In fact, I think it's another way of saying meaningful educational benefit. I really do. So... I've, uh, at least from what I can tell, the courts have not surprised me since this decision at all. But I will say that when the Supreme Court used this new language, the Supreme Court didn't decide whether Andrew received FAPE. What the Supreme Court said was, we're sending it back down with this standard, rather than merely more than de minimis, with this standard, now revisit the evidence and decide whether Andrew received a free appropriate public education. And I'm sure you heard about a year later in February of 2018, the original judge that ruled that Andrew had received FAPE looked at it again, compared the IEPs essentially from first grade on forward to the IEP that was recommended for fifth grade and essentially felt like the goals replicated themselves from one year to the next. And that there really wasn't a whole lot of movement or tweaking of those short-term objectives. And while supported perhaps minimal gains for Andrew, that was no longer going to cut it under this new standard and ruled that Andrew in fact did not receive a free appropriate public education. And then it was reported last summer that the case settled. The, the school district decided, let's stop this. We don't need to go further because we know probably what the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals is going to say. So the case settled for $1.3 million. And that caught the attention, at least in my part of the country, of a lot of advocacy groups and things like that. And we saw, a, I think, a spike in the litigation. Um, and to the degree, though, that there was some thought pattern, pattern that this significantly raised the bar and that school districts were going to have to do completely different things than they were already doing, assuming they were already doing the right thing, my conclusion was, and I truly felt in most cases that we were, that it really shouldn't be that big a change. It's just a huge reminder of what we need to be focused on from a content perspective. So that's the overall FAPE standard. And it's funny, I remember the first time I ever heard that acronym FAPE. It's like one of those events in your life and you know exactly where you are. And I remember it was my first day as a lawyer. I had been corralled into the job of going with a law firm and they actually told me this during my interviews where I was pretty much voluntold that I would become a special ed lawyer because none of the other lawyers in the firm wanted to do it. And they represented the largest school district in the state of Georgia at the time that was under siege with special ed litigation. 
Well, in law school, there was, it was unheard of to even have an education law course, much less something that had you know, some information about public law 94142. But because I had worked with students with disabilities, I was all in. I thought, this is great. I didn't even know this federal law was out there. Although I thought I was going to be a corporate tax attorney. Hey, I can do this too. I'm, I'm happy with that. But my first day on the job was going with the law partner I'd been assigned to and sitting in a due process hearing. And I heard all these acronyms being thrown around. FAPE was the one I heard the most. And I was so concerned because I thought everybody was saying FATE with a T. <laughs> and I got really anxious. I'm like, why are they talking about FATE? You know, if FATE controls everything, why did I even bother going to law school? <laughs> I mean, and why are we litigating if fate's going to control it anyhow? I was like, what in the world are they talking about? And then slowly but surely I learned all of this. But it still has, and even as a lawyer, become crystal clear what it is because it's so individualized, and you well know that. But this gives us the language now that we need to be using at IEP meetings. In our process, when referring to content, we have to defend ourselves by saying that we really do think that this child will make progress with what we've recommended, that our data supports that. That's the lingo we need to be using. Of course, we all know that the IEP and what's within the four corners of that document are what I call Exhibit A for the school district. That's what we're going to put forward defending ourselves, showing that we made FAPE available to this particular student. So the IEP actually becomes the focus of all the FAPE litigation. It's Exhibit 1, Exhibit A, whatever we want to call it. And in fact, the Andrew Court called the IEP the centerpiece of the delivery for FAPE. Another Supreme Court called it the primary vehicle for delivering FAPE. And still another Supreme Court called the IEP the modus operandi for getting the FAPE job done. So it's going to be front and center in terms of our evidence. And how do we defend the appropriateness of that IEP? So the second thing that Rowley is best known for, in addition to the rejection of maximization of potential and employing some educational benefit, is what I call the process content standard for determining the appropriateness of that IEP. And that's where process comes in. That's when it becomes really important is when we analyze what the Rowley Court said way back in 1982. And every case I read today where the IEP is being examined for legal appropriateness, every court still uses this two-pronged inquiry. It's what they call it. I call it the content, the process content standard. And it's because we have two questions. The first one is process, the second one is content. So the first question in examining the appropriate, appropriateness of an IEP is in the development of that IEP, did the school folks comply with the procedures set forth under the IDEA? And that's all of those procedural requirements where we're dotting all our I's, crossing all of our T's, those things that are ultimately probably impossible to be totally in compliance with, but we do the best we can in terms of the process that we have used, particularly in the development of the IEP. And then second, if so, in the development of that IEP using an appropriate process, is that IEP reasonably calculated to enable the child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances? Prior to Andrew, it was to receive some educational benefit under Rowley. I've tweaked it now to add the Andrew language, and I call it the Rowley Andrew process content standard. Now, Andrew was a content case. Andrew didn't deal with any of the procedures in the development of the IEP. It was all about the content in that IEP and the program and whether or not Andrew made progress there. But the Andrew Court, as I say in my materials, did point out that schools should not lose sight of the fact that the procedural requirements that emphasize collaboration between the parties in the development of the IEP shouldn't be lost. Don't forget about the process pieces. But this is my go-to. It has been for 30 years. 
when a case comes into our office, I actually have a checklist. Let's look at the process pieces and let's look at the content pieces. Now, the question that oftentimes is asked and sometimes answered in court cases, if the answer to question number one is no, does that mean that we stop there and find a denial of faith? Does it always mean that? Fortunately, the answer is no, it doesn't always mean that, but it could. And so what we have found is that there are procedural or process issues that can be fate fatal, and I'm going to talk about and focus on those as my dirty dozen, okay? The ones that can lead to a denial of fate. Before I abandon this two-pronged inquiry, though, what about the, the fact, what if the answer is yes? Courts, the Supreme Court actually said, if the answer to question number one is yes, more than likely the answer to question number two is yes, because good process leads to good content. And that's true. That's why we focus so much on process. But oftentimes, procedural problems can lead in and of themselves to a denial of faith, such that the court won't even go to the, que the second question, to look at whether the content is appropriate. And for that reason, from now on, we're not talking about content. We're going to focus on process issues. That's what this is all about. But the way I set it up, I wanted you to understand how important process is. And that's why we need to examine these because they can in and of themselves and on some occasions constitute a denial of faith. Now clearly, as I said earlier, not every procedural process violation, the answer to question number one is no, not every time, does that mean it's a denial of faith? And Congress was so worried about this in 2004, you might remember, and then the 2006 regulations, we got specific language on this, ultimately saying, you know, not every procedural violation automatically constitutes a denial of faith, and hearing officers and courts need to look at the substantive nature of the IEP, but there are some procedural violations that could deny FAPE if they impede the child's right overall to FAPE, if they significantly impeded the parent's opportunity to participate in the decision-making process regarding the provision of FAPE, or if the procedural technicality caused a deprivation, an actual deprivation of educational benefit. So this is the language in our regulations today primarily because Congress was concerned that so many courts were ruling against school districts merely because there was a process violation that answered a question number one was no, case closed, don't pass go, don't collect 200, done. And courts were like, well, shouldn't there be more of a no harm, no foul as it relates to process issues? Now, if you're being monitored by your State Department of Education, those kind of process things are going to lead ding, 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 corrective action. But that doesn't necessarily mean the failure to dot an I or cross a T automatically means a child was deprived of free appropriate public education. So it's different in monitoring than it is in the courts that apply this legal standard of what effect did it actually have. So this is an incorporation of no harm, no foul that your Seventh Circuit traditionally has upheld my 11th circuit early, early on had a case, and I use this one to make this a little bit practical. Let's bring it down, practical example of what we're talking about here, and what this language means. In an old case that we had in my circuit, there was a case, called, it was called Doe versus Alabama State Department of Education, and the parent attorney was arguing that the school system was responsible for funding a residential treatment placement very expensive placement for a child with a disability because the parents were, did not receive a written notice of an IEP meeting. So the answer to the first question was no, and their argument was every time it's no, we win. Stop right there. And actually the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals looked at that argument and said, I see where you're coming from. 
Because the answer to the first question is no. So yeah, I see what you're saying there, okay, but this court is not going to hold that every single time there is a procedural violation that it automatically constitutes a denial of faith. We just can't do that. Now here in this case, yes, there was a procedural violation. The parents did not receive a written notice of the IEP meeting, but they came to the meeting. So we're not going to hold in what, what us lawyers ty lawyer types call strict liability. Not every single procedural violation automatically constitutes a denial of fate, but if it does significantly impede the parent's opportunity to meaningfully participate in the decision making, then that is going to be significant. But these parents came. Now what if they didn't come and the school team went ahead? That might have been a different outcome. But that was a no harm, no foul standard in our circuit that was incorporated into the actual language of the law later on. Okay, so that's how that all came about. But procedural problems that, and I highlighted, significantly impede a parent's opportunity to participate. It is obviously agreed upon by all the courts that that is fate fatal. So that's going to be my focus for the dirty dozen. It's primarily those that are fate fatal because they somehow, some way, denied the parents meaningful opportunity or input into the IEP team decision making process. I also find this important because, and I don't know how it is in Indiana, but I suspect it's the same. Every due process hearing request that comes into our office, every complaint, has an allegation in it. And there's one frequent filer, as I call him, that represents a lot of families in our state. He puts this in all caps. And the allegation is the school district significantly impeded the parent's opportunity to participate in the decision making. And sometimes it's in the hopes that that's what they'll be able to show. And many parent attorneys have actually told me that it is easier to show a procedural violation than it is to prove that the program is not adequate. And so they would rather win on a procedural technicality, at least in my experience, than the substantive piece of it. I don't blame them. I would do the same thing because it's easy to show procedural violations. I've never picked up a file that didn't have a process mistake in it. A lot of state monitors would say the same thing. So yeah, there might be some undotted I's or uncrossed T's, but that doesn't necessarily mean legally it was a denial of free appropriate public education unless it's one of these fate fatal procedural violations. And the significantly impeded the parent's opportunity one is the one that's most common. Okay, does that make sense the way I've set it up? All right, let's move on then. And nothing real special about my slides here, but just to give us an additional visual um, uh, enhancement <laughs> to the handout that uh, hopefully you've been able to download. There's a lot more to my materials than what I'm, I'm going to be putting up on the screen. But I've got obviously 12 of these. So the first one is all about preparing for IEP meetings. And I remember the days... Remember, I've been around for quite a while. I remember the days when folks did not even want to talk about a child at the water fountain for fear that they would be tagged with predetermination or even fill out anything on the draft, like, oh, no, let's, let's go in with an absolutely spotless draft. So in 1999, the IDEA regulations were amended to add the language that I have there on page four that basically said, now school people can engage in preparatory activities. That's why I call it preparatory activities. They can engage in preparatory activities and discuss certain things that aren't, you know, predetermining placement and they can get ready for meetings and they can prepare. And they can have meetings to prepare for IEP meetings as long as we don't get so firm in our decision making at that preparatory meeting or whatever it might be. So we know we can prepare and should prepare. I always say there is nothing less impressive 
than a group of school professionals sitting around an IEP team table who are not prepared for that meeting. From a perception perspective, I worry, of course, about the lawyer on the other side who's there because I don't go to meetings unless there's another lawyer there, right? I've never been to a warm, fuzzy IEP meeting. I hear they happen, but I've never <laughs> been to one of those. I have to go to the adversarial ones all the time. And their eyes light up when they see things that, oh, you, you had a meeting two weeks ago, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. They love to try to trap school folks, in my view, in these kinds of scenarios. Again, in the hopes that question one will be answered with a no and that it was some form of predetermination. But clearly you can prepare. I worry more about what the parent must be thinking. Wow, these folks aren't even prepared for this meeting. What must my child's day look like? That's what I worry about the most, frankly. So in any event, yes, we can prepare. I was doing a presentation to, uh, training some special ed teachers a couple weeks ago, and one of the teachers raised her hand, and she was asking me a question, and she said something like, well, when we engage in P PA, blah, 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 and she went on with her question, and I couldn't get past the acronym. I was like, PA. Public announcement, parent advocate, what does PA mean? So I, I stopped her and I said, could you tell me what PA means? I'm not familiar with that. She said, oh, that's preparatory activities. I said, do you have an acronym for that? <laughs> they're so paranoid making sure everybody knows what they're doing is preparatory activities. So that's what the IDEA regulations say. We can engage in preparatory activities. And I have also found in my career that 99.9% .9 of parents of students with disabilities appreciate that school folks have engaged in appropriate preparatory activities. But what we want to do is make sure that if we have a meeting to prepare, or we prepare a draft, or whatever it might be, everybody knows it's for preparatory purposes only. It's for, you know, discussion purposes only, all of that kind of stuff. So we want to make sure that people understand that. We don't want to get too prepared. Courts acknowledge preparatory activities and that schools are going to have to engage in preparation. On page five, one of my favorite all-time cases is the Doyle case, acknowledging that school people will prepare and although they have to come to the IEP team table with an open mind, that doesn't mean they come with a blank mind. Now, of course, I always, you know, smile a little bit and ask people, how many of you have been to an IEP meeting with a blank mind? Sometimes that happens, but, you know, oftentimes it doesn't. Hopefully it doesn't. But courts acknowledge preparatory activities, but not getting so prepared that it winds up being what courts refer to as predetermination of placement. And I talk about this a lot. I could actually do the whole, my whole time together with you on just predetermination. <laughs> and instances of it in courts that have found that that in and of itself is a denial of fate. And I put it in quotation marks because it has legal connotation. All the circuits agree that if something looks like predetermination of placement, that in and of itself is a denial of a free appropriate public education. Doesn't matter whether the program is a good program or not. So I, when I'm training in Hawaii, and oh gosh darn, somebody's got to train in Hawaii, so it might as well be me. <laughs> Rats. They have a lot of special ed legal issues. Tons of litigation. I mean, I can't even keep up with it, actually. But I call predetermination the big kahuna of procedural mistakes because it is the one that we want to train folks to be sure that it's all about making sure that we afford parents that meaningful opportunity to participate that we don't show up at the meeting saying we've got this all figured out or even saying that before the meeting itself. One of my all time oldies but goodies cases is the Spielberg case listed on page five of your materials. And this involved a situation where the parent, I mean, I'm sorry, the school attorney wrote a letter to the parent's attorney and it went something like, this is a reminder we're gonna be having an IEP meeting next Tuesday, but before we get there, just wanna give you a heads up the school folks have already met and they've decided the child's program is going to be this. And they will not discuss any other options. Sincerely, yours. see you next Tuesday. And this is something you don't want as a school attorney that your own letter is exhibit one for the other side, which is what happened in that particular case. In fact, 
the court ruling against the school district, ordering the school to pay for private school for the student, basically took that letter and reprinted it in the order and said, this is clear evidence of predetermination. Years ago, I was actually talking about this case um, within some framework at a National School Boards Association meeting, and this fella came up to me afterwards, and he said, that was me that wrote that letter in the Spielberg case. And I said something very Southern, like, well, bless your heart, sweetie. <laughs> but how was he to know? That's what makes special ed law very weird, because you can lose your case based on a procedural issue, whether the program's good, enough, good, good or not. And that's what he was arguing to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. He said, you need to look at the quality of program X. It's a good program. The court said, we don't care. Question number one, mm -mm, you predetermined placement, we're not even going to look to the quality of the program. So that's why we can get bogged down in concerns over process because especially those fate fatal ones. Now, we want to avoid as many as we can, no matter, but especially those that are like predetermination, that are fate fatal. The Berry case is another example of a case, and there are tons of these. I'm just giving you some of the highlights. The Berry case on page five is a case where the assistant superintendent who was serving as the LEA representative at the IEP meeting started the meeting out after everyone introduced themselves by saying the purpose of our meeting today is to develop an IEP for Johnny to go to the blank program. And this was a recorded statement and the court was like, in the intro? And this is why we want to use good processes to keep people from wanting to jump all the way to placement in the very beginning of the meeting. Like a good agenda, a good facilitated approach where we have organization and efficiency. Not only can it help to, to avoid procedural problems, it helps to ensure legal compliance as well and order to things, because I've been to so many meetings that are chaotic, first of all, but people want to go to the bottom line, even when the parent wants to do that. Well, I just want to know what the placement's going to be. I don't have time to do all this other stuff. No, we've got a lot of things we have to get through, and that helps organize everything, but it, as a bonus, helps with the process, and as a second bonus, um, helps with um, legal compliance. There's also a case here, it's a fairly recent case at the bottom of page five, the JR case. We also wanna be careful what we say to parents even before meetings. This was an instructional specialist who called the parent on the phone the night before the meeting and said, you better get ready for a fight. <laughs> and that was taken as, oh, so you already know what's gonna happen at the meeting tomorrow. You're already set in stone with that. And that quote was the whole case. The court actually, though, looked at what happened at the meeting. Okay, yeah, someone said that, but now I gotta look at what happened at the meeting. And it was hours and hours of discussion, robust discussion, about what that child's placement should look like. So the fact that the person said it, uh-oh, is a red flag, but the court ruled that it was not predetermination because the court went on to look at what actually happened at the meeting. But do we wanna avoid those statements at all costs? Yeah because they become red herrings, they become the focus, the reason why perhaps we're even in the litigation in the first place. All right, number two, handle draft IEP documents with care. So I remember, like I said, people don't even want to, you know, in the olden days, didn't want to even put the name of the child on a line of the document. Let's just start from scratch when we get there for fear there be some argument of predetermination. But clearly we can draft. There was early litigation, the GD versus Westmoreland case on page six there, was an argument that because the school people drafted an IEP ahead of time, that automatically was predetermination and illegal. And the First Circuit Court of Appeals rejected that and courts have rejected that for a long time. But that was an argument that was made early on in the litigation. So it's important that courts have upheld the school's ability in preparatory activities to draft IEP documents and other relevant data. And as I said, most of the time parents are going to appreciate that that's been done. There's some interesting language on the bottom of page seven and over to page eight from the US Department of Education. 
the 2006 commentary to the IDEA regulations. These are the last commentary we've had. We are in desperate need, as you know, of an overhaul at this point. Uh, it's been since 2004 that we've gotten those amendments, so we're, we're, we're just waiting. But way back when, there were some advocates that were objecting to schools' ability to draft anything ahead of time. And they wanted the regulations to forbid even drafting. And USDOE's commentary here was, well, we don't wholly support drafting because we worry sometimes that that might negate the ability of the team to talk about the individual needs of the child or what have you, but we're not going to outlaw drafts. But we're going to say here that we have some concerns about it if it gets to be too finalized or what have you and keeps the team from having a discussion about the needs of the child. But they go on to say, but drafts are okay and if you create them, you should provide them to parents ahead of time. So this is a question I get a lot in terms of process. Certainly the law doesn't require drafts to be created, but the USDOE suggests here that if they are, we should provide them to parents if feasible, ahead of time to give them an opportunity to also meaningfully prepare for that IEP meeting. So again, the law doesn't say one way or the other, but I think that's interesting language. But there are a whole lot of these cases where it was argued that drafting the IEP, the case, the JS case on the top of page seven, they actually drafted an IEP and it was circulated amongst the staff for about a week ahead of the meeting and people were weighing in on it and making their changes and it was circulated, but the court said, I need to look at what happened at the meeting. If the school people walked in and said, said have we got a deal for you, here's the draft of the IEP, we just need for you to do, read over and sign it, then that's going to be a problem. But if it's not presented that way, if we're working through that draft together, then clearly courts are going to say it wasn't a form of predetermination. I have some clients that will actually display the draft up on a screen during the meeting and everybody's working on that draft together so that it is a collaborative event in terms of making it clear that we are not solid on this draft, that it is for discussion purposes only. But if we, even if we stamp draft on every page and we hand it to the parent as if it's a done deal, then that becomes pro problematic. So handling these documents with care is the do that I have there. Number three, you'd be surprised how much litigation is about who was at the IEP team table. It becomes a process violation that is very commonly inserted into the litigation because under the law, we are required to have certain people that I call mandatory school team members at every IEP team meeting. But in my view, it's not enough to just have them in attendance. I think it's vital that we train everybody to be prepared to fulfill their roles and responsibilities at IEP meetings as well. Now, there's nothing in the law that says you have to train anybody on that. But here's somebody who's been there for a long time and known that, wow, when somebody wasn't prepared or somebody didn't fulfill their role or responsibility, that became a legal problem for that particular school district. So in your materials on page, and this tip is found on page eight, I have listed the mandatory members of IEP teams there who is to be sitting around the table. Of course, parents are number one. We do our best to try as best we can to follow the requirements to document and make those reasonable good faith efforts available to have them attend our meetings. But from the school's perspective, the mandatory team members that are listed there are members two through five. So that's your regular ed teacher, special ed teacher, LEA representative, and someone who can interpret the instructional implications of evaluation results. That's under federal law. Sometimes when I'm training from state to state, I look into whether the state may actually add to that list of mandatory team members. Most states don't but it may be discretionary too in terms of who we're gonna have there. Some school districts may even add, but federal scheme members two through five are mandatory members that are required to be at every meeting, to be at the entire meeting, 
unless they have been properly excused formally from the meeting. And so I talk about the formal excusal procedure there in your materials as well, which to me is riddled with its own procedural landmines along the way because you have to get written permission, consent, agreement from the parent to excuse somebody. It's pretty complicated to get it done. Now the problem with this particular do, and every time I present on it I make some statement like this, and that is it falls into the category of what I might call, and it's certainly not fate fatal in every case. Kind of depends on the fact situation, but it happens enough to include it here. But it's also, fall, in my view, it falls into the category of what I call the doing the best we can <laughs> procedural requirement. It seems that Congress and the U.S. Department of Ed believe that school staff are sitting in their schools waiting for their next IEP meeting. <laughs> that they have nothing else to do, no other responsibilities, but to go from one IEP meeting to the next. Is that true? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it, and, and I'll also say, and I read this legislative history way back when when I was trying to figure out this law, Congress also said that the average IEP meeting would take 20 minutes. <laughs> Not even on a good day, right? So come on. So this one just has to fall into that category of we do the best we can to comply with this. And hopefully, if we're not compliant, it's not necessarily fate fatal. And so I'm always going to argue it's not, but sometimes it could be. So it kind of depends on the situation. But um, in any event, this is one I commonly see is problematic uh, for, for a number of reasons. I guess the ones that... I see the most that are problematic and that we see in the case law are ones dealing with LEA representatives and the second group of cases is regular ed teachers. I don't think I've ever seen a case where the special ed teacher wasn't there. <laughs> That's our go-to person, right? I mean, poor special ed teachers, they have to handle all the process and all the content of every meeting, which is completely wrong in my view and I think impossible for them to do most of the time. And what I find is when I'm at a meeting and that special ed teacher trying to run the meeting and also deal with all, be responsible for the content, so they become a process and content person, what we come out with is not so good process and not so good content. So the LEA rep representative to me, and this is just my take on it based on my experience, is a really good person to serve as the process leader for the meeting. Now, what's happening nationally that I kind of like because I think it's going to lead to improved outcomes for students with disabilities is getting school administrators more involved in special education. And there are states that have kind of grouped together to come up with these training programs and all kinds of things so that this becomes part of leadership training for administrators. And there are states that are moving to having more school administrators attending meetings as LEA representatives. So I talked to my first group this morning about that in Indiana and I got a, some, yep, yeah, that's what we're seeing that kind of trend. I'm not saying it has to happen. Under the law, it doesn't really tell us who serves as an LEA representative as long as the criteria is met. And LEAs are number four, and there's that criteria there that I've listed. So we know that's got to happen. We know that that person has to meet the criteria of being qualified to provide or supervise specially designed instruction, knowledgeable about the general curriculum, and knowledgeable about the resources. And the USDOE has also said, and can commit resources. Okay, so who this person is, we're just seeing nationally as I travel around, a significant push for more administrators. They can't be in every single meeting, of course. But in some meetings, why not? In Alabama, when I moved there 15 years ago, I was started my practice in Georgia, moved to Alabama, and I saw a trend, I mean, like an unwritten rule that the school administrator is designated as an LEA representative or their designee. And so what I found were groups of assistant principals that I would be training, and it's usually the newly anointed assistant principal who's serving as LEA representative. 
So I ask a room full of them, how many of you serve as LEA reps? And all the hands go up. I'm saying, how many of you have ever been trained to do that? Huh? I thought LEA stood for least experienced administrator. Or no, no, it's local education agency. <laughs> you know, uh-oh, that's problematic. But our administrators have good leadership skills and can guide IEP team meetings in an organized and efficient way so that the content people can do their jobs. That's my view. That's just, just my view of that. But in any event, we do need to have somebody that leads the process, and it could be the LEA representative. It doesn't have to be, but my mindset is we really seriously should consider that. In the Pitchford case, there was not an LEA representative at the meeting who met the criteria at one of the IEP meetings at issue of four IEP meetings that they had uh, four different years. So the court voided that third year IEP because there was nobody serving as an LEA rep at that meeting. So there are other cases like that, but it could be one of those procedural violations that winds up being fate fatal as well. Regular ed teachers, second question that I often get, usually from regular ed teachers who are asking, why do I have to go? Because I teach regular ed, that's not my student. We know the problems of that kind of statement. But regular ed teachers, many of you may not know this, but it was added as an additional attendee, regular ed teachers, added in 1997. It's part of the IDEA amendments then. And as of July 1st, 1998, every IEP team needed to have a regular ed teacher of the child, if the child is, or maybe participating in the regular ed environment. But regular ed teachers have not been brought in sufficiently into the fold either, particularly as it relates to their roles and responsibilities. And so sometimes I will see regular ed teachers, assuming they are at the meeting, but serving as what I might refer to as a token IEP team member, which means that somebody stuck their head out in the hallway and said, hey, aren't you a regular ed teacher? We need somebody quick to come fill this chair. Could you just come sit? You don't have to say anything. And I can tell you that's the person that has all over their face the frustration, they're annoyed, they're looking at their watch, they're looking at their computer, not paying any attention. And what message are we sending to the parent in that particular situation? So we should have no token members. And in fact, there's a 2019 letter from the US Department of Ed, letter to Holler that I cite on page 10, that says that. Now it's in response to having administrators there who don't know anything about the child and why would we have them there? They just talk about, you should have nobody there that doesn't have a role or responsibility at an IEP team meeting. And that clearly makes sense. There's a lot of things that regular ed teachers can do. They should be bringing data, they should, all kinds of things that they should equally have. And some, some regular ed teachers have better da data than our special ed teachers do as it relates to making good recommendations about students. But there's a case there, the ML case that I train a lot with where the court felt like the failure of the regular ed teacher to attend at all was in and of itself a critical structural defect in the team membership and a denial of fate in and of itself. So it can happen to be a fate fatal procedural mistake. But I understand that we can't have all these people all the time. This is where I think it, when reauthorization comes up again, this should be a big deal. I think schools should present this in a way that I think is a legitimate way to present it, and that is that having all these people at every single meeting is very intimidating to parents. I mean, parents show up at their first IEP meeting, and there's no fewer than five to seven people sitting around that table, and that's not the school's fault, it's the way the law is set up. The process is very parent unfriendly. So Congress needs to give us more discretion on who absolutely has to be at every meeting. I think it should depend on what the issue is. Sometimes less is more, particularly as it relates to that. I talked to a lot of parents who say I felt ganged up on, it was intimidating, producing lots of anxiety, all the lingo that everybody, I mean, it's just overwhelming. And if you have unnecessary people sitting around the table, then we shouldn't. That's my view anyway. 
Number four, don't refuse to consider all information and input that's provided by parents or their invitees. Give them sufficient opportunity to express concerns and engage in discussion. You know, this is a hard one because I get a lot of questions about how long do we have to let this discussion go on. And it's hard to know when to cut something off, you know. And there, but there are good communication skills that, you, that can be used to try to rope people in. And it's not just parents that go on and on. School staff do it too. And sometimes the process leader needs to use good skills to try to address that particular issue. But we don't want to do what the LEA representative did on page 10, the RL case that I cite there where there was a recommendation for services made, but the parents wanted to discuss some other options because they were just concerned about this child being thrown into, after having been on hospital homebound for many years, a senior high school environment in Miami, which was thousands of children. And they wanted to discuss some other options, and the LEA said, nope, we've made our recommendation, and if you don't like it, you can take us to mediation. And the court said that was shutting the parents down, not giving them meaningful opportunity for input and serious consideration of their concerns. So engaging in that discussion. Now, the operative word is, and I have to say this because I don't know if it's going on in Indiana, but have you noticed, or we've noticed at least in our jurisdiction, that there are doctors that actually are experts in special ed? I mean, they you know, I love it, prescribing IEPs, um, rose-colored glasses, one-to-one -one aids, you know, you name it. So, you know, where is that coming from? And do we have to do that? The bottom line is, and I think Jim Walsh did a good presentation, say thank you, you know, that kind of thing. It's considerate for what it's worth. We consider it, and that's the operative word in this particular don't is making sure that we don't refuse to consider that information. Parents sometimes tend to want to bring other people with them. We have to consider their input as well. So we do. Um, some parents have told me, well, I took 10 people with me to the meeting because I want to win the IEP. Uh, well, it doesn't, we know it doesn't work that way. It's not a voting procedure. I kid my friends in Florida that voting doesn't work there anyway. Um, they don't think that's funny, but I do, so I keep saying it. But, you know, the Sackett's Harbor case is one of those kinds of cases. But bringing other people in and considering what everybody has to say is important. And there's a lot of case law there and the materials regarding that. To reflect a good process was employed at the meeting. I highly recommend that you consider keeping drafts of IEPs and or meeting notes taken contempor contemporaneously with the meeting to document discussions during IEP meetings. And the reason I say that is there are lots and lots of case decisions where courts have looked at even the drafts and comparing it with the final. And if there's a whole lot of change made to that draft at the meeting with the parent, particularly when it incorporates a lot of the suggestions or requests that the parent made, that's very helpful evidence. Meeting notes, to me, are vital, but as I travel around the country, I don't necessarily see that as a standard, but conference record, whatever it might be, boy, they have saved the day so many times because we, didn't, we don't have anybody around who remembers what happened at that meeting. But we've got contemporaneous notes and the parents have a copy of them and it's hard for them later on to try to challenge them if they've had them that long. So that's just something that, you know, us lawyers have three rules and that's document, document, document. So that's why I like to suggest those. And courts have looked at meeting notes and drafts and I've given you some court decisions there where they did that. Sharing fully with parents all evaluative information upon which we rely not that they're going to have to understand every single thing we talk about, but we try to cogently and rationally explain everything as best we can. But we want to make sure that parents have the access to all the evaluative data that we have when we make recommendations, good, bad, or ugly. Okay, everything, so that they are informed participant, a formed decision maker. The Amanda J case is one of the go-to cases with respect to that issue, sharing that information. 
Number seven, don't make recommendations that are unclear or lack finality. This again is part of parent participation where the argument is, well, they weren't clear what they were offering. I didn't understand that to be the case. So how am I a meaningful participant if they weren't clear? So things like to be determined, as needed, those kinds of things in IEPs are, you know, eyebrow raisers to me. Also, too, saying, well, it could be this program or it could be that program. We're not real sure, you know, we're offering up three options, but the team never, you know, closes the deal in terms of the discussion there, in terms of what is it we are going to offer. There are a couple of recent cases that I've cited in the materials that talk about the provision of speech language services. Whether it's a group model or a pull-out model, that is huge in the cases, and it seems like most of the courts go with more specificity. So we need to train everybody to be real specific about what that's going to look like as best we can for that particular student. Number eight, don't make educational recommendations or decisions based on the availability of services. This is another one that's kind of akin to predetermination where all that matters is what we have available or what someone can or cannot do rather than getting parent input on it. It doesn't really matter what the parent wants or the parent says the child needs. It's already a done deal because we don't have it available. So some, you know, adding to the list for people when you're training them of things not to say, like we don't have that here, which really isn't relevant. What's relevant is, are what we, you know, is what we're offering based on the data appropriate to meet the needs of the child. Whether we have it or don't have it just doesn't matter. So that's why it's important because parents can argue that that denied them meaningful opportunity to participate if what controls is what we have available. Or somebody says, well, I would do that, but my schedule won't allow that the speech therapist or whomever. Now whose needs are we focused on? So that big gets a little dangerous. Somebody's going to have to jump in. And I have jumped in so many times at IEP meetings with questions like, well, let's get back to your data. And that 30 minutes two times a week that you offered, is that what you think is necessary for this child to make progress? <laughs> Back to that question, almost sending a hint to that person, get off your schedule, we admire you, we understand your caseload. But when somebody says we'd have to hire 10 more therapists to get that done for everybody, is not helpful. And so we've got to train people why that is uh, a problem and to recognize it when it happens and hopefully get that derailing train back on <laughs> the track and, and hopefully before the meeting ends. Um, to have a good facilitator there that can help with that kind of thing. But those are um, big issues. The probably, I would say, most famous case nationally is the deal case that's there on page 17 that I cite. And the deal case involved a lot of recorded IEP team meetings and administrators at these meetings saying things like, we don't offer that program here. Um, the powers that be have told us we could never offer that program. Someone else said, if the taxpayers would just pay their taxes in our county, we could afford to provide that program. So those are the kinds of issues that um, can, can, can be, <laughs> can be uh, problematic. Number nine, computerized, software-based, web-based programs. We're, I think everybody has one of those these days. In Alabama, we have a statewide form that is required with all the procedural forms and everything that goes with it. But as I travel around, I know that states and school districts are all different. But I know one thing I do know is I no longer see the days of a handwritten IEP, handwritten, handwritten in longhand. Anybody remember those days? I always like to ask that because when there are no hands that go up anymore, that's my signal it's time for me to go. Right. <laughs> OK. I mean, when I'm teaching younger uh, special ed teachers, literally, they look at me like I've grown another head, like it, it, it out longhand. Really? And worse than that, it was that NCR paper, you know, the, you know, the three versions of, of those mistakes. 
But now that we've moved to the pushes of the button type thing, it's easy to cut and paste, all those kinds of things. I was at, I've been at several meetings actually, where the advocate or the parent will ask, can we consider such and such as an option? And the teacher's over there, click, 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 click. That's not in the drop box. And I'm thinking to myself, can we think outside the drop box for a second? Because I get really concerned about that because it looks like the drop box controls our options here, not the parent's input, not, you know. So it's a process, can, basically could be a process violation that could constitute a denial of faith. I'll just point out one case in this section on page 18. It's out of my jurisdiction. It's out of a case, Alabama 11th Circuit Court of Appeals where the court ruled a denial of fate because it was very clear that folks were just wedded to what the court called stock goals. The child was reading at a ninth grade level and they were, they had, you know, cut, no, kid was reading at a first grade level, but they cut out of state standards, ninth grade reading goal. And the court said, <laughs> so what? That is just not even close to appropriate for the child. But the worst part with respect to this issue that I'm talking about, every time the child's name appeared in the IEP, someone crossed it out and wrote in the right name. So it was a clear kind of cut and paste job from another student's IEP, that kind of thing. So we just need to be real careful about that for a number of reasons. Even mistakes, there's one case that I always um, focus on with teachers particularly and um, that is uh, a case where the, there was cut and paste, but they lifted like typos and errors in grammar from IEP to IEP. And the court just pointed that out, said, I just, you know, it's just not a good look, uh, if, if nothing else. Number 10, don't make educational recommendations based on cost. I've already sort of referred to that a little bit, but cost isn't relevant. How I wish. I've dreamed of going to a federal judge and saying, Your Honor, I'm Julie Weatherly. I'm here on behalf of XYZ School District. I move to dismiss this litigation because the school system <laughs> doesn't have any money. We're broke. And the judge would say, You're right, Ms. Weatherly, case dismissed. <laughs> but courts do not embrace cost as a defense to meeting the needs of a child and a providing FAPE. So it's just not relevant to say at an IEP meeting, do you know how much that would cost if we did that for everybody? The advocate's gonna say, don't really care about everybody else, number one, but it doesn't matter. So we've brought that into the conversation. The question needs to be, is that necessary for the child to make progress? No matter how costly it might be, because again, courts don't really care. And it bothers me to even talk about that because that's our biggest issue is the lack of funding and I don't I hate to sound like Debbie Downer on Saturday Night Live I should probably talk like this you know but, but for 30 some odd years I've been hearing Congress people saying I'm gonna introduce the full funding of the IDEA law and I've been hearing that and hearing that and hearing that and still what I see is more demands with less with less money to do it. Um, so I hope they're successful this time with the new version, um, but um, I'm skeptical. Number 11, do appropriately provide parents with notice of their right. This is all about the procedural safeguard and parent, right, parent rights. And I already talked about the fact that the law is so unfriendly to parents. And so when we seek changes, we should say things like, it's unfriendly to parents. That's why we need more discretion about who sits at IEP meetings and more discretion about what we put in these notices and things like that. How many of you read, have read the parent rights lately? Well, I highly recommend them. Hey, you don't even need happy hour uh, this afternoon. Go read those, <laughs> sit down and read them. They're scary, but they're required. And I understand why they're required. But the first thing we send about an IEP meeting the invitation, the written invitation looks like a subpoena. I mean, I mean, if you really think about it, so the process is, it's not our fault. It's what could we do to make it a little bit better. But the parent rights certainly clearly must be provided whether we like it or not. Some of my clients have actually come up with a one page parent friendly version that goes along with the one that's full of all of the legal and special education ease that parents don't necessarily understand. 
And lastly, do implement appropriate pr procedures for recording IEP meetings. I get this question a lot, so I decided to make this one the last one. Um, essentially, nationally, what I see are school districts employing practices that if a parent really wants to record, then let's don't make a big deal of it and we just record it too. That's the general rule that I see around the country. Some states actually require um, school districts to allow parents to record. Uh, California is one of those that I know, I think from my, the group that I had this morning, my understanding here is that most of you in Indiana subscribe to the yes, okay, we'll allow the parent to record, but we're gonna record it too, because it's just easier. And sometimes we don't even know if the parents are recording anyway. I always train people to just assume that that meeting is being recorded and we shouldn't worry about that. We, we don't have anything to hide, that shouldn't be a problem anyway. And someone said this in my morning session that Indiana is a one party consent state in terms of one party if they know it's being recorded. So that whole you know criminal aspect of it, um, violating state law is out of it. Alabama is the same as Indiana, but Florida is two party consent. So it's a little bit, a little bit different, but not really. Um, as is said in this letter to Savitt from the U.S. Department of Education in 2016 on page 20, essentially it's up to school districts and states to decide what they want to do with respect to recording. And you could disallow recording or ask a parent to cease recording if indeed they do not need it in order to meaningfully participate. But they said any kind of policy you have that doesn't allow recording needs to take into account parents who may need to in order to meaningfully participate in the decision making process, which clearly makes sense. But again, most of the time that I've been involved, and this doesn't happen a lot, but in my world it does, so I tend to overgeneralize, but most of mine have been situations where the recorder or recording device was hidden and Nobody knew about it and what are we gonna do about that? But generally I'd like to say, let's don't make a big deal of it. You know, hopefully there's nothing there. And I will tell you in my three decades of working in this area, recorded conversations have actually helped rather than hurt the school district. I had one case where the parent attorney entered the recording, the transcript of the recording into evidence. And then later on I was using it to cross examine and he moved to withdraw it. And I said, no, we want it in. <laughs> because it was helpful in terms of the robust discussions that we were having, not taking one little thing out of context and trying to use it. There has been a concern though that things have been taken out of context and posted online, social media or something. Um, I've had some of those situations occur and some school boards have decided to, you know, band ban recording and not allow for it except to only in cases where parents demonstrate a need. Up to you, up to the school district to decide what to do with that. So we have about, I would say, eight minutes left. Is that about right? Seven, eight minutes left. Um, are there any questions, comments, concerns about the Dirty Dozen that I've been through? Thank you very much and thank you for everything you do.